Hello everybody, thanks for joining me this evening. This evening I'm going to do a question and answer thing and there have been some questions asked already, they were on the community forum thing, so I'm going to jump straight in into those, I'm going to answer those as best I can and then I'll take questions as they come up. Just seen straight away James has asked, not seen do a live, Dr. Ruth in five weeks since you're alive with her. Um, she ha I'm not sure what's going on there. I know she has uh, put out some videos recently. Given the nature of the videos, there has been a lot of work put into them and quite a bit of research into them. So that could have been taken up a lot of her time. Other than that, I'm not quite sure. But it would be good to see her back. I enjoy her live streams. She's far better at live streams than me. More knowledgeable than me as well. But anyway, never mind. First question comes from, and forgive me, because a lot of these are usernames. I'm not going to pronounce them properly, but T. Cancella had asked about codependency. Now, codependency is often, it's it's described as like a pattern of behavior where somebody like prioritizes the needs of other people, their partner or whoever it is. Um, they will prioritize their needs to an excessive extent and it's often to the detriment of their own well-being and there can be different reasons for it you know there can be low self-esteem difficulty with setting boundaries there could be the fear of being rejected abandoned be a lot of people pleasing behaviors one of the questions was is it like a love addiction well some view it as a love addiction but codependency it's like everything else it's never really a one-size-fits-all there's a lot of different degrees a lot of different tones, shades, types. Uh, it's quite a complex thing. Some might see it as a love addiction. And this is where someone is seeking validation and fulfillment through their relationships, through the, the person they're with. But again, it's often at the expense of their own needs. It can be like, I heard it once described as the dis-ease. Now, not a disease, but the dis-ease of the lost self. Someone feels like they're only really complete if they're with someone else it's you know if i'm okay if you're okay others might see it as more like a love deficiency um they might lack a sense of self-worth self-compassion things like that again it's quite a a, a multi-layered thing and the more i'm talking about it i could probably be here for the rest of the session talking about it what i might do is i might do a video on about the different types of codependency um but again, one, part of the question was, uh, you know, where does it come from? Well, it can be influenced by a variety of factors. It could be could be upbringing, could be uh, trauma, neglect, abuse, things like that. Could be different environmental factors. Growing up in, say, a dysfunctional family, emotional needs weren't really met, so someone becomes almost dependent on other people meeting their their um, their emotional needs. Um, the last part of the question was about different therapeutic approaches, which would be the best one. I'm not an advocate of the best type of therapy. There are a lot of different modalities out there, and I think they all have their value. I think they can work with different people in different uh, different ways. I think sometimes it comes down to the individual. Some, per some people might like a directive approach. Some people might like something to be open-ended. They might, might just like to explore things themselves. Um, some people might like to go into their past. So you might get a like a psychodynamic approach, and this is really someone who's learning to understand how they form and maintain relationships, their relationship with themselves, with the world around them. Some people might like, say, a person-centered approach. It's, it's very talking through things, um, being heard, being listened to, being validated, being understood, and exploring in, in very gentle ways. Some people might like CBT or DBT, which... You know, it's it's like behavioral modification, things like that. Every everyone's different. Sometimes it might even be a combination of things. So I wouldn't say there is one specific approach that's best. There's therapists out there might practice something and say this is the best approach, and that's fair enough. Um, I think it really comes down to the individual. I think it also comes down to when it comes to approaches. I think it comes down to the therapist as well. A lot of the work is done in the therapeutic relationship i think regardless of the approach but uh codependency just as i'm thinking about that question that's something i might look at a bit more in depth i might do a video on it um 
I hope that answered your question. I can't really go into a lot of that because I do have a lot of questions to get through before I even get to uh, the questions on the on the chat board. Second one came from uh, Pauline, Pauline D, 4190. It's, it's, it's difficult because they're all usernames. It's, but anyway, it's just me. I, I still live in the analog age. Um, and the question was about narcissistic traits. Are they innate? Are they learned where they come from? And there was a question about you know, they're maybe developing later on in life. Well, the jury is always out on whether or not it's nature or it's nurture. I, I go with, I suppose, the majority. It can be a bit of both. Some people can be predisposed um, to act. They might have characteristics. As we grow older, they tend to lessen, you know, we become self-absorbed and stuff. Um, it's all about us and everything's unfair, especially when you think you're a teenager, you know, um, all your friends are allowed out late and you're not. That's grossly unfair. Um, these kind of come down as we grow older. Then other times um, it can be, uh, again, it could be our upbringing. It could be um, the social environment we're in. Um, there could be a sense of entitlement. Um Becoming later on in life, someone might have the traits as, as we all do, but they're not through the roof, if you know what I mean. But different circumstances might happen. There could be a lot of career success, for instance. There's different relationship dynamics. Social status can change. And sometimes the traits that are there start to heighten a bit. I suppose the example I'm thinking of is someone could be just average going about their day to day and suddenly they win the lottery. They're a multimillionaire. Um, if you will, it goes to their head. They start behaving as if they're royalty. Um, so that there could be that. There could be traumatic, stressful events. So someone becomes very uh, guarded. They want to uh, keep uh, control of their environment and so on. So a lot of people would say there can't be an increase in narcissism there. Um, I believe there is the, 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 the nature part. Sometimes some things can be inherited. There is a predisposition. There might be something neurological going on, but I do believe it's largely environmental. A lot of the behaviors I believe are learned. Again, could be learned in childhood from social groups, friends, things like that. People hung around with at school could be their parents, could be a lot of different dynamics. As people grow older, you have things like social media. We see the way people behave on social media, you know, looking for likes, clicks, things like that. People live in their best life. So they learn that, you know, they want they want to be more like that. They they want to be the best, they want to have the best. It's never really a one size fits all, but I do believe that it's largely learned. The traits, the characteristics are there, but the behavior, the way that comes out. It's learned. We learn from each other. We learn from other people. We People learn what works for them. Um, not taking responsibility for themselves gets them out of certain situations. So they keep on behaving like that. They believe that if they were to admit they were wrong or flawed about something or an error, mistake, whatever, that's a sign of weakness. So they will keep on rejecting that. The, at the core of narcissism remembers that false sense of self. Um, so it's all, all those behaviors are aimed at protecting that false sense of self. The behaviors I believe are learned as, as people grow. Um, so as much as there can be something biological or genetic going on, I think the, the social aspect, the environmental experiences, I, I think they play a far bigger role. And there's people on a higher pay grade than me can come up with a better explanation. They can probably articulate it better. Um, but I think it's largely learned behavior. Okay. Um, this one I'm not even going to try to pronounce, but it's user and then a load of letters and numbers. The question was about shame, uh, about shame being a motivator for toxic behavior. I think that's a really good question because shame, shame is one of those things I think we sometimes struggle with it. We, we um, sometimes, I think we confuse it for guilt. We think they're the same thing, but they're not really. Uh, guilt, I believe, anyway, 
Guilt is what we feel whenever we think about something we've done, the consequences of something we've done. Whereas shame is what we feel if others are thinking about the consequences of something we have done, especially if they keep reminding us, they keep dragging it up. Another way of looking at shame can be, shame is what I feel when I think about what I am. Okay, so, but the thing about shame is, it can bring up feelings of inadequacy, there's embarrassment, embarrassment about themselves or about their actions. The question about it being a motivator for toxic behavior, well, if you think of narcissism, it is largely shame-based. Now, something I, I've said quite a few times is narcissistic people can behave in very shameful ways in order to try to escape feelings of shame. So you get to see a lot of the grandiosity, a lot of the gaslighting, a lot of the lies, a lot of the manipulation and so on. Everything they do is is, is like trying to protect that, that sense of self. The thought of being wrong, mistaken, the thought of being maybe just ordinary, not as special as they believe they are, that can bring up a lot of shame. And I think it's the shame that drives a lot of the behavior, which is why I say they behave in shameful ways in order to escape feelings of shame. But the thing about shame is it doesn't necessarily have to be a toxic kind of shame. Shame's not a nice feeling. None of us like it, but Whenever we do a little bit of self-reflection, shame can help us regulate our behavior. In other words, we're not going to do something or behave in such a way that's going to lead us to feel shameful. Um, we can, you know, if we, with a capacity for self-reflection and have a good support network around us and things like that, we can still feel the shame, but it doesn't necessarily have to dictate our actions. As much as it can be a driver for toxic behaviors, shame can also be a deterrent to asking for help. Some people are embarrassed to ask for help. They, they, they think there's maybe something wrong with them because they need help and couldn't be further from the truth. Um, say shame is a difficult one. Carl Jung described shame as the soul eating emotion. Um, and I think that's a very, very powerful description. I don't think it has to be um when it is toxic and people are trying to protect that sense of themselves yeah that's when you get the manipulation the aggression the deceit and things like that the deflecting of their own flaws their own errors and things like that the behavior is largely aimed at trying to alleviate that sense of shame you've heard you know people talk about projection a lot of the times they would project their shame onto other people they would even use other people's shame in order to try and manipulate them and control them but as i say it doesn't necessarily have to be a toxic thing we all feel shame embarrassment from time to time i think a healthy response is maybe acknowledging it and processing the feelings around it whatever our sense of inadequacy or wrongdoing or whatever it was to try to put it into a context and even those feelings of inadequacy i mean inadequate how you know, uh, that, that, that old expression, I think it was Mark Twain, you know, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb trees, it's going to think it's useless. You know, the fish isn't designed to, to climb trees. Some people may be faster, they may be stronger, they may be smarter on their feet, they may, be, uh, they may have more money or whatever. That does not necessarily make another person inadequate because we all have strengths and qualities in different ways. We're not all on the same... No, we're not all on the same book, never mind on the same page, you know. So again, having a, a good, healthy capacity for self-reflection, even having a good support network, network around us, being able to, uh, even if we're on some kind of a healing process, sometimes we are working through feelings of shame. What I have said quite a few times is, especially if you've been on the wrong end of someone who's been behaving very toxically, there's no shame in having been lied to. There's no shame in having believed the lie. Um, we're not clairvoyant. We can't see the future. You know, we don't know the, the end from the beginning. There's no shame in being on the wrong end of a narcissistic person. If we do feel there is, that can be a deterrent to asking for help and trying to move forward, trying to heal. Um, it's really... It's like anything else. It's trying to put it in the context and regulate 
into a context and allow it to inform our not necessarily make decisions for us. So user ZN4RM4CH6Q. Um, I hope that answered your question. I did do a video and the video was about probably about two or three years old. It's an old one. It was done with my first camera and I just used the mic that was on the camera. So it's not great, but I did do a video about toxic shame. So if you have a look at that, there might be some more information in that that you might find useful. <coughs> Coughing again. Genag, I hope I've pronounced that right, um, had asked the question about trying to support someone who is uh, enmeshed with their mother. Well, it's a very difficult one because, well, first of all, I, d I don't know the nature of the relationship but um, or the dynamics that are going on. But when someone is enmeshed, what you sometimes find is the other person, the mother, the parent, maybe has a bit too much influence on the relationship. Maybe there's a, a, a home dynamic there, you know, there's grandkids and so on. When someone is enmeshed, they might not always necessarily know it. Now, I made a video, I think it was about a year or so ago, about how do you help someone if you suspect someone is being abused somehow. Now, I'm not saying this person's being abused, but I think the, the kind of things would, be the same kind of thing. First of all, we don't fully know the nature of the relationship between them. We can see it from the outside, but we don't really know what's going on internally. If you're having conversations about it, listen, listen to him and listen to him intently, listen to him openly, listen to him talk about that relationship and try to do it without judgment because quite often what we do is we jump in with advice. We say, but what about this and what about that? with any conversation we don't always have to agree but we can still validate and show that we understand someone feels something or maybe why they feel it we're not necessarily agreeing we're not necessarily fully understanding and things like that but we are being open to to listening as i say without without judgment there are different ways maybe trying to encourage a little bit of self-reflection there's different ways you can do this um just asking about the nature of the relationship and the different kind of boundaries and what would happen if this and what would happen if that. And I was wondering, had you thought about it? There's a lot of different different ways we can do that to try and encourage some kind of self-reflection, even the the impact that, that something could be having, not just on them, but on you and on everyone else. Try to offer practical support. And again, not try to fix, not try to repair, not try to, you know, pull them out of something. Um, but offer practical support, you know, identifying different kind of strategies for managing boundaries, the managing the relationship. It's not always about trying to cut someone off. It's not always about, you know, trying to get rid of them and, you know, go no contact. It's about maybe trying to develop a new kind of relationship. It's not something you're probably going to be able to do in one conversation. It might be take a bit of time, could be several conversations. You might have to keep coming back to it, um, but just be patient and be supportive. Um, whenever there is kind of emotional entanglement with anything, I always say it's easier to move forward than to move on. Um, but even that is a gradual process. It takes time and effort. You know, you show as much encouragement as you can and you be patient pay attention to any small little changes um, that could be happening even discuss therapy as an option um so that they can you know go and talk it through with someone who doesn't know the situation um to talk it through with someone who will listen to them and again maybe try to find ways of still having a healthy relationship but not one that's so enmeshed it's a <laughs> Difficult questions to answer because, again, with, when you don't know the full dynamics, you don't know the nature of the relationship. But that video I made about how do you, you know, how do you help someone if you think they're being abused, I'm not suggesting he's being abused. But there are some things in that that you might find helpful because even where there is some kind of enmeshment or even if there is some kind of you know horrible stuff going on between them, what we don't always know is what's really going on internally and how someone feels. And I always say that 
even if you were to be just blunt and honest and tell them, or even if you were to try and be as gentle as you could and wrap it up in cotton wool, we don't always see that. In and that's the last thing we want to do. So we just try to be as gentle as we can. Okay. Um, I hope you found that helpful. I'm, I know it wasn't a definitive answer. Here's what you should definitely do. But I hope there were some some things there you find you find helpful. Um, this is a bit of a long one, and I don't know how to <laughs> pronounce this. Cinta is C I N T I A M E I R E L L E S. I have a feeling that's two names put together. Anyway, um, talking about feeling let down and frustrated by being let down by others, and it can be disheartening. Um, yeah, it is. I would say it's normal to experience a wide range of emotions, things like frustration, disappointment. You could, might even blame yourself. Again, not knowing the context of the question, is it the same person who continually lets you down? Is it a group of people who keep letting you down? Or is it just people in general you feel are letting you down? Something to, th something to think about is, I talked about this in a live stream, uh, a few live streams ago. You focus on what you can control and what you can't. We cannot always control what other people do, but we can control our responses to them. Something to think about is our expectations. Now, if it is the one person and they continually keep on letting you down, keep on disappointing you, maybe there's something in, in just, when I say don't trust them any longer, I don't mean you assume they're lying, but don't put so much confidence or faith in them. If, they, if it's the same person that keeps on letting you down. So we maybe reflect on your expectations. Um, sometimes we might, even if we were honest with ourselves, we set expectations that are way too high. Someone might let us down, and it could be for a genuine reason. You know, they were coming to collect us, but their car broke down or something. So there can be genuine reasons. But if someone is continually letting us down, yeah, maybe we need to just stop having confidence in them, maybe stop asking them. Practice a bit of self-compassion. Um, it's okay. It's not a nice feeling, but it is okay to feel let down. It's okay to feel disappointed. Um, again, you focus on the control that you do have. Maybe think about uh, positive relationships, other people in your life, people who can be dependable, people you don't necessarily have to ask for things. They might offer things, or if you do ask them, if they arrange something, they're genuine. They're genuine. They usually follow three. Um, try to focus on the positive relationships. If again it is someone or some people who continually keep letting you down, when, I, when I'm saying this, you know, think about letting them go. What I don't mean is you don't bother with them anymore. What I don't mean is you go, you know, no contact and stuff like that. That's not what I'm suggesting. You just learn to stop relying on them. Um, maybe tap into your own sense of resourcefulness, you know, or the things you can do for yourself or the things that you're relying on. Can other people uh, or other environments or other relationships, can they provide some of those things? Um, if you find yourself beating yourself up, again, a little bit of self, a uh, little bit of self-compassion. You focus on what you can control and what you can't. You cannot control other people. The most we'll do is encourage. The most we'll do is influence. But what we cannot do is we cannot control them. Think how frustrating it is whenever they try and control us. And try not to blame yourself either. Um, because again, if someone doesn't follow through with a promise they made, that wasn't your fault. That was on them. Okay, You take your responsibility that maybe you trusted them but you had no control over their actions. That's completely different. I hope you may have found that helpful. Um, again, not knowing the situation, I can only be very general. Um, next one is Stupin Sardi, 2738. Asked about managing narcissistic in-laws who try to turn the children against you. Um, yeah. It, I guess it really depends on the age of the children. If they're still young and they're still in your care, it is. It's about looking at maybe um, setting, managing boundaries, showing that there can and will be consequences if they keep crossing them. 
even as they get a bit older, you're thinking maybe about teenage, things like that, and they have their phones so, you know, grandparents can contact them and things like that. Just try to keep uh, open communication with them. Try to keep open lines of commun communication with them. Um, be genuine. Be authentic. Um, don't be the version of you that maybe someone is saying that you are. Try to show them what a healthy relationship is. Um, show them that it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to get it wrong, but it's okay to acknowledge it, make up for it, things like that. Again, being authentic. Um, try to focus on the relationship with the children. When you show them the best version of yourself, you know, uh, you're strengthening your bond with them, you know, express your love to them. Um, do things with them spend quality time with them doing the things that they enjoy do them do it together things like that um again as they get older you know maybe they move home or something maybe that's still going on it would be the same kind of thing you try to keep the open communication you try to spend time with them you be authentic you be the best version of yourself that you can answer their questions answer their questions honestly if they ask questions um and you're not necessarily bad mouthing the other person now, it depends on what's going on by the way um you know if it is incredibly toxic bad dangerous whatever it happens to be you know you take whatever action you have to be you might have to be honest with them but if they're just being on their hand if they're just being unkind if they're just gossiping yeah you just be honest with them because the thing is in-laws narcissistic in-laws and i've made videos about mother-in-laws and father-in-laws and stuff like that it can be like any kind of um, toxic behavior it can be complex multifaceted can come from many different directions many different ways and it can be emotionally draining um and when kids are being alienated let's say this even when couples are separated and kids are being alienated trying to be the best version of yourself not the version that's being created not the version that's being painted of you trying to be you know the person you always were and being authentic being genuine um sometimes that's as much as we can be and the thing about kids is they're not kids forever they grow up they can form their own opinions they get to see themselves sometimes it's like pulling the curtains back and you just see it's just some guy pulling levers it's not a wizard at all you know that takes a bit of time, but we do get there eventually. The last question that came up on the community thing is from another user, IQ4J sort of thing. So hope you know who you are, hope you recognize this. Was asking about withholding things like affection, attention, money, information. The question is, love to learn more about withholding affection, attention, money, information of any kind. Um, it's crazy when it's completely unnecessary. Yeah, this is, this is something I say pretty much every live stream. We do not like things that don't make sense. It drives us insane. We like to have a reason. We do not like things that don't make sense. That's why we ruminate, analyze, fill in the blanks in our head, have conversations in our head and so on. Um, so when things are withheld, it, there's never a one size fits all answer why there can be different reasons now i did do two videos one on narcissistic neglect which is different from abuse it's neglect it can be a form of abuse but it's more neglect withholding things and i did one on the effect that it can have on people um but the reasons why some people might withhold things like you know money attention whatever it happens to be it can be there's a lack of empathy. In other words, they don't understand why it's important. They don't know why it's important to you, why you need it. Um, could be a lack of empathy in the sense that they just don't care because they're the important ones. It can be as a form of coercion and control. It can be, it depends on the situation. Sometimes there's no intent behind it. It's just that you're not even on the radar, but other times it can be a form of coercion because things aren't always withheld. Sometimes they are there. Sometimes they are there to entice you back again. Sometimes they're there as maybe like a little bit of a reward or something or a treat or something just to keep you interested. Um, sometimes it can be because again, with narcissistic people, there is a need for domination, control, things like that. 
they like to be the alpha, they like to be superior, they like to be in charge. So when they have access to these things, it's like they control them, they feel as if they're in charge. But if they were to allow open access to some of these things, even if it's just attention, by the way, even if it's just a little bit of love and affection, sometimes depending on where they are in that spectrum, I guess, it can feel as if they're maybe losing a sense of control. The other people, the other person is now powerful or something. If you think of it in those terms, they have some kind of power and that doesn't sit well with them. When they are in control of the things, whether it's the money, the information, whatever it is, it can be a, a like a, a power game to them. So it really depends on the person. Next door's dog's barking, which means he's going to start in a moment. What do you hear? Sit down, you. Yes, you. Sit down. Come here. Good boy. <coughs> so there are the questions that uh, came up on the community feed. Um, I, I hope I answered them. I probably didn't answer them as, as well as you would have liked, but I'm just giving my opinion. Would you really? He's not crawling under my feet. So I'm going to back. I'm going to have a look at some of the questions and see, uh, Monique. Great to see you. It's nice to see you too, uh, Monique. Glad you're here. Nice to see you all. Um, oh, you always appreciate learning. That's good, and I appreciate. It. I'm glad you like the content. Uh, see, Jim. So uh, let me see. Where did it come from? Great talk. I'm so delighted everybody likes the content. What I'm going to do at the end of this, by the way, is what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to put together um, resources for people. I've said before that I can't always offer the resources people would want. Things like courses, forums, and things like that. But I have it. Talk in the head, you. I'm talking to people. Seriously. No. No. Never work with animals or children. Shh, behave. Um, yeah, go spend the rest of the evening. Normally he sits in the corner quiet. He has a nap. Next door's got a new dog, you see, and he wants a friend. <laughs> um, what was I talking about? Yeah, I've been talking about resources. So at the end of the video, I'm going to talk about uh, two different avenues of support you might want to look at. Um, but anyway, get back to the questions. Uh, let me see. Is it normal being delicate for emotional? That means weakness. Uh, Adam, no, emotions aren't a weakness. Uh, emotions are normal. Um, our feelings, I think, are the most honest thing about us. That being said, would you stop it? Really? Guest appearance. Um, our feelings are not always an accurate reflection of reality. We could feel something um if we're not regulating if we're not understanding what we feel it's going to make uh we're gonna if you will make decisions based on that we'll start ruminating analyzing things like that largely based on how, how we feel feelings are not a sign of weakness feelings are perfectly normal they are human they drive so much of us um some of our decision making you know some of our preferences things like that our choice of partners you know um choice of career um having feelings does is not a sign of weakness. It's perfectly normal. Imagine if you didn't have feelings. You'd be like a machine, like an android. Um, hello, Darren. Videos. Mexico Plata. I'm glad you find them. Uh, never had therapy. Feel older. Is it a covert? Sorry, I'll start this question again. Is it a good older covert or regular remarks? They tend to be very, very hurtful. And then they say they're kidding. Yeah, um, unkind humor, cruel humor is often, um, we all joke, we all banter, we all tease. Um, with narcissism, it's used as a form of, well, first of all, they're testing to see how far they can go, especially if they meet someone for the first time and it's only a joke. But when they're getting away with it, um, yeah, it becomes the norm and it stops being banter. And I think... The cruel, unkind nature of the humor. It's not a nice way of putting it, but I think sometimes what we're seeing is the sadistic side of them. Sadistic in the sense that that's taking pleasure from the pain, misery, and humiliation of others. So when it's unkind humor, um, yeah, there is a sadistic element to it. 
Uh, why would a narcissistic grandmother use her own grandchild? Do they not know how wrong that is? It really depends on the person. It depends on that level of awareness. Um, why would they do it? Only she knows the motivations. Um, so whatever it is she's trying to do, it could be try to, you know, gain people onto their side, recruit their little flying monkeys or whatever, you know. They're trying to do that. Um, they're trying to get, get some sense of validation. It could be anything like that. Not knowing how wrong it is, well, again, that really depends on the person where they are in that spectrum. For some people, they're fine. They know exactly what they're doing. The, the end justifies the means. Other people might not necessarily know what they're doing. Again, the lack of empathy. They don't necessarily understand that what they're doing um, has such a negative impact. They're only thinking, again, of um, their own agenda. So it really depends. The only person who will ever know is that person themselves. The question is dealing with it, how we deal with it. Uh, your brother like this? How do I convince my avoidantly attached boyfriend that he is worthy of love? The most we can ever do is influence. The most we can ever do is motivate. The most we can ever do is encourage. It's it's up to the other person. Um, Again, depending on where people are and how they are, where they are in their own journey of recovery, if you will. Um, can you all hear that whimpering? You think I was cruel to him or something? He just wants out because there's a dog next door. No. Be out. I'll let you out later. Um, depends on where people are on that. That Depends on people were even on their own recovery journey, if you will. So I said earlier on, it's about maybe just trying to be patient, but we'll have to be honest, we all only have so much capacity for patience. Um, the other person has to put in a bit of work themselves. Uh, Bono Maggi says, folks around here pride themselves on their manipulation skills, makes them feel intelligent. Well, it's a really intelligence and manipulation. I mean, if you can't get your point across, so if you can't have your own needs met, if you can't win an argument just through your intelligence or just by being honest, I don't think there's anything smart about manipulating. They're just, just my thoughts, though. Um, hello, Cara says, hi there, Doc McGee. It's just, it's just Darren. I'm not a doctor. I, so often say I would like to be the doctor. I've got a little TARDIS behind me there. Um, but no, just just Darren. But yeah, glad you find the channel helpful. Um, if BPT and your partner assumes you're just being dramatic when you're overreacting to the situation, how do you explain why your emotions seem more extreme than theirs? Well, if they know that you have BPD, um, they might... If they don't already, it's maybe trying to explain how difficult it is to regulate how you feel. Um, there are different approaches. If you're getting help, if you're getting support, if you're in therapy at the moment, there may be different things you could be looking at. And I know that some people talk about DBT, that's dialectical behavioral therapy. They find that very helpful for it. Um, what I would say is you take a bit of time, maybe in a, a, a placid moment, a calm moment, whatever you want to talk, to maybe articulate what was going on, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, um, and try to do it in those times because it isn't always easy whenever tensions are high. It isn't always easy whenever, um, you know, we're extremely anxious, we're extremely frightened, we're extremely angry. It isn't always easy to do that. I would say it's it's... It isn't easy to shake hands with a clenched fist. So maybe in the calmer, lucid moments when things are going just fine, maybe just try and have a calm conversation. Uh, Young Lum says, I wish Darren could be my therapist, man. <laughs> um, well, for the next 20 minutes or so, I think I am anyway, even just in a small way. No, I shouldn't really say that. 
Um, oh, I shouldn't have. I don't know. I always doubt myself. I'm glad you find it helpful. That's that's all I'll say. Glad you find it helpful. Um, what if you've made mistakes and arguments in the past and you're not trying to change, but any time a mild argument starts, partner treats as if you're acting like you used to? This is a difficult one. Um, yeah, it depends on how long two people have been together. Um, I think the important thing is if someone can learn from their mistakes um, and they do put in a consistent effort, um, but this is the thing about arguments. I think sometimes it's about how we have arguments. It's not that we don't argue. See couples that tell you they don't argue, check for a pulse, you know, either that or tell them they're lying. Maybe they shouldn't be together. We can't always be on the same page. Can't always agree to everything. We all will have different perspectives. But when we argue, we often think of win and lose. Who wins? Who gets the last word? Who puts the other one in their place? Who gets their own way? When you think a bit differently, you think about win-win, it becomes a completely different conversation. You know, uh, it's about healing, not harming. Fixing, not blaming. It's problem solving, not fault finding. It's about trying to agree a way forward that suits everybody. Um, it becomes a completely different conversation. So it's not necessarily that you don't argue. It's maybe how you argue. Um, if that was of any help. No. I haven't, Adam, I haven't forgot my water. I actually have a glass of Coke. Going up in the world. Uh, okay, let me see. Can you give recommendations how to help a narcissist, an infantile person, open up to their partner and fully understand everything the partner does or says to her for her own good? that's not an easy question to answer you can be genuine you can be authentic um but other than that it really comes down to the other person um again depending on where they are if if someone is narcissistic and they're feeling threatened their sense of self is being threatened um they're going to behave very defensively um the thought of being open might be scary it could be it could be any number of reasons i think when we're just authentic that's as much as we can do we can encourage we can show um and again it depends on how open the other person is to this but we show that we're not a threat we're not there to criticize we're not there to make fun of we're not there to try and win anything uh, that's as much as we can do but it's really up to the other person what we cannot do is we cannot change other people and that's i think that's one of the reasons that a lot of people feel uh, as if they're being driven insane because no matter what they do seems to work sometimes over a period of time um when someone is open to making mistakes or whatever and they see that their partner isn't embarrassing them for it jumping on them for it, whatever it happens to be sometimes it, it but it depends on the person sometimes you might find they open up a little bit more and they might not open up all of the time they might open up and then afterwards they close down again so it can be a process but what we cannot do is we we, we cannot change them we cannot make them um we can encourage and that's about it difference between normal shame and npd shame that's a very good question isabel um normal shame is something we all feel um again we feel you know, other people are thinking about the consequences of something we've done. So we don't feel good about that. We can feel we we'll feel shame for that. And we all feel shame over past actions, things we've done, things we've said. We can all feel a, a sense of shame. NPD shame um, is very much, it's like I say, a lot of their behavior is, is more about trying to escape shame. There is at that very core that false sense of self that false sense of self is like if you want it's trying to suppress it's trying to get rid of feelings of shame of not being important of not being the alpha of not being unique well they are unique but no more unique than anybody else you know um they are not entitled they do not get a medal for just turning up they have to work 
the same as everybody else. Um, you, you know, they have to put the effort in. And there are other people who are smarter than them. They're, you know, faster than them, better looking than them, they're more accomplished than them. So there's a lack of humility. Um, so a lot of what you see is trying to escape that feeling of shame of not being special, of not being the center of the universe, of not being amazing, of not being, you know, worthy of worship. I think that's the difference. Um, the, again, going back to the, the shame that we all feel, we can feel shame about something we did or said. You know, even even when we were teenagers, you know, we all do stupid, silly, crazy things when we're teenagers, thinking we're the smartest person in the world. And afterwards, we're going, what the hell was I thinking? We know not to do that again because we don't want to feel that shame again. So we know not to do that again. We have learned. Um, with narcissism, the thought of doing something and it is embarrassing or shameful, um, it's almost like they keep doing the same thing until it's no longer shameful. Um, because to acknowledge they did something wrong in the first place is going to bring up shame. So it's it's like a it's like a negative feedback loop. It keeps it keeps feeding off uh, it keeps feeding off itself. Um, I hope that answered your question. Again, probably didn't go into too depth, but I'm just thinking that is a really good topic for me to cover. I might do that more in depth actually difference between shame and npd shame hmm. thank you for that question isabel it's giving me a good idea for actually a video topic um let me see very helpful great insight society's destroyed community every person on their own i think if you believe a lot of what you see on social media that that can be true and i think in a lot of cases that can be true as well um, but not necessarily. There are communities, there are groups, there are families. I'm a big believer in exceptions. There are always exceptions. Um, there are still people, community groups, religious groups, you know, churches, things like that, regardless of the faith, by the way, regardless of the religion. Um, and there is still um, there is still a sense of community about them. They do still value uh, things like family connection things like that friendship even even just you know just common decency um and it, it, it's 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 lovely to see um stop giving up precious energy to people who don't reciprocate yeah i, I would agree you just wear yourself out uh where does the demonic state come from asks pauline when a truthful person changes completely uh well really define what you mean by demonic um you mean possessed by something uh, or do you mean bad wicked toxic behavior um everybody's path's different it could be terrible things have happened to them it could be amazing things have happened to them and they just suddenly again they've won the lottery so they think they're royalty and they start to become very selfish everybody's path's different there is no one answer i think could answer a question like that there are a lot of different paths if you think of if you think of a tree when you look at a tree you know it's a tree because you can see the trunk and all that sort of thing what you don't see are a lot of different roots under the ground lots of different directions and all those roots are leading up to the tree they all lead up to the one tree but they're all coming from different directions even when you get to the tree once you get to the top of the tree, those branches go off in different directions. So it's it's very hard to pinpoint a one size fits all kind of answer. Um, so let me see, where do we get to? Thank you. Acknowledging mistakes, help them do it. Okay, Sam is asking, uh, why do narcissistic parents exclude one child out of their children? What makes them pick the child? They exclude the, the scapegoat. Again, there can be many different reasons for this. Sometimes I think this is common. Uh, I'm not saying this is the only answer, but I think this is probably um, a common reason. The narcissistic parent, I think, chooses, if you want to call it that, chooses the child that looks most like them. You know, you get kids, some will look like mom, some are going to look like dad, some are going to look like a bit of both. Um, I think commonly it's the child that looks 
most like them, the one that reminds them of themselves, maybe. I think as the kids grow older, it can be the one that they um, maybe see as the most, uh, you know, well, maybe, no, I wouldn't say accomplished, not accomplished yet, but have the potential. He can hear that dog barking. Oh, he's going crazy. No, 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 no. Say hello to everyone. Don't look at me, look at them. Get down. Um, the scapegoat child is the child that's often uh, held accountable. They're, they're held, made the, they're blamed for all the family's misery. The, the other child, that golden child, it's like they're getting all the love, the affection, maybe all the best toys and stuff like that. The other child is, if you will, they're neglected. Um, the reasons why they pick can vary, but I do believe it. It's quite often it's the child that looks most like them. Uh, there can be exceptions, of course. Uh, need to stay close to God. Glory to God. A lot of people find um, find a lot of comfort in their faith. Yeah. Um, where do we get to? Think about going to therapy you're still young i always say therapy make therapy your first uh, course of action well depending on what it is sometimes you want to go to your doctor your gp or something but um if you need to work through something you're trying to recover from something you know whether it's abuse um, you know anxiety stress things like that you don't always have to go into therapy for years on end you don't have to do that sometimes even just a few sessions can help you get through something that you're struggling with if it's something that has happened over a long period of time um, yeah, and it's had a huge impact on it. It's changed the way you view yourself, the way you view the world around you. I think seeing a counsellor, seeing a therapist is um, a good place to start. Tommy, thank you for your answer. You're welcome, Sam. Um, golden child gets all the fun stuff, can end up arrogant and out of touch. The golden child does get a lot of the fun stuff, but something to consider, and this is often uh, overlooked when people talk about narcissistic families, just because the golden child is separated and is given, if you will, special treatment, the one the other kids or the other kid, depending, are often compared unfavorably to, the golden child is not immune or exempt from the neglect and the abuse. Sometimes the golden child, even though you know they're separated or given the preferential treatment, sometimes they're held to a higher standard. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, the parent can cut them a lot of slack, blame the other kids if something goes wrong. But if that golden child messes up outside the house, remember, it's all about image. That golden child messes up messes up outside the house. They've got further to fall. There are cases where the golden child, as they're growing up, they have that crown, but they know that crown is precarious. That crown could be taken from them at any moment because even though they're being treated like the favourite, um, there have been little things happen along the way. That crown could get taken off them and given to one of the other kids, even if it's just for an afternoon, you know. Um, so the golden child doesn't always have what you would call a charmed life. They maybe get treated better than the other kids, but they're not exempt or immune to any of the stuff that's going on. Um, So, yeah, coming towards the end because it is coming up to nine as well. Um, so, yes, what I was going to say as well about resources, and I'm going to put them in, in the, the description for this. So there's two resources that uh, I'm going to talk about. First of all, and I have talked about it before, would be Jay Reed. He's another therapist. He's based in uh, California. Uh, he has resources to help people um, that have, growing up in narcissistic families, environments, things like that. He has a Facebook page and support um, through through that. He has resources, courses, things like that. If, if you put me, if you check out his stuff, if you check out his uh, channel, even his website, you'll find the details on it. There's a video where he and I have talked previously where we've discussed these things and he talks about the different stages. Um, uh, he calls them the three pillars to recovery. 
Um, so if you want to watch that, he can outline them. Uh, he can articulate them a lot better than I can. It's understanding it. It's uh, you know getting grips with ourselves about looking uh, ways to move forward, move on, things like that. Um, very intelligent guy, knows his stuff. Uh, very very. Um, a lot of really really good content on his channel even watch a few of his videos just to get an idea of 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 the uh the, the wealth of knowledge and insight that he has so that would be one the other one um would be richard grannon now richard grannon he's based in the uk how this came about this is a strange thing he had advertised that he was starting a, he was uh, going to run a new course for people and I'm interested, as I always am, and I did the same thing with him. I do with many people. I ask, you know, could you just give me some information about the course? Um, because I like to have stuff to signpost people to. Well, he didn't just give me information on the course. He gave me access to it. So um, I haven't went through it all. There's there's a lot of different lectures, a lot of different stuff. Um, it's really, really good. He's working with another guy, uh, Mark Vicente. Hope I pronounced his name right. Um looking at the cult-like nature of narcissism, narcissistic families, narcissistic relationships. There's a, a lot of information, a lot of um, educating yourself, uh, a lot of being able to untangle yourself, unmesh yourself from what he calls that narcissistic matrix, get yourself out of that matrix. It does require a lot of work. I don't think recovery comes easy. It does require work. It's work that is well worth the effort. So I'm going to put the details to, to his course in here as well um, in, the, in the description of the video. So ha have a look at that. Um, see if there's something there you would find helpful. The other thing I will say is after looking at his course, he's asked me to attend. He's, he's doing a seminar in May in Liverpool, and he's asked me to speak at it. So I'm excited and nervous. Mm. Um, so I'm going to be there. I'll be talking about um, the narcissistic family unit. Um, so I always call there's a matriarch or a patriarch, sometimes both. I call them the grand worshipful master, she who must be obeyed, you know, at the head and then the different dynamics that go on within. Uh, different behaviors, characteristics, um, what it looks like to the outside world, but the chaos that's actually going inside and how they manage to control this, how they manage to do this. So I'll be talking about that in May. Uh, so if anybody's free, uh, go on to Richard's page. I think he's advertising. I've advertised it in mine thing as well. You'll see it. So if you're free, by all means, go along. But have a look at his course. Have a look at Jay Reed's stuff. Have a look at his stuff as well. Um, because you might find something really useful, really helpful. Um, what I like about both both those uh, guys is they don't just talk about you know how bad this is, how bad that is, and you know why people. Um, there's very practical solutions as to why, or uh, explanations rather as to why, but a lot of good um, stuff about how to um, become unmeshed, how to how to find your sense of self, how to um, Get yourself out of that 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 matrix. How to, as I like to say, how to move forward. I think when we move forward, the moving on sometimes catches up. So there's a lot of good information there. Have have a look at them both. And um, I'm just going to take one or two more questions. Um, I love Richard Grant, and you guys should collab. We have talked about it, and we probably will. He's up for it. I'm up for it. Uh, it's going to be a question of when can we arrange it and what topic topic are we going to cover. My topic of interest at the moment, he's talking about narcissistic psychopathy a lot these days. Um, my topic of interest is the dark personality, and that's where you see the four things. You see the narcissism, the psychopathy, but you also see the manipulative Machiavellian side and the sadistic side. And when those four things are combined oh, you have someone you really, really shouldn't take your eyes off. You need to keep yourself safe. I, I think it's a fascinating construct and, and the different ways that, that uh, those those things combine, the different things that happen when those things combine. So, yeah, there will be a collab uh, at some point. It's going to be when and what is our actual topic. Um, Monique says, fantastic, you're doing great. Oh, thank you very much. How not to be lost. 
when I figure that out, I will let you know. Uh, would you love that guy? Love yourself first. Be nice to people who deserve it. I would say love yourself first and those who deserve it. Um, yeah, your integrity, your self-respect, your self-compassion and things like that. When you have things like that, um, yeah, you, you can still, other people, you can be friendly, you can be polite, you can be courteous, you can even be compassionate. Um, but you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily try to rescue, try to rescue people that don't want to be rescued. You don't try to fix people that think they're fine as they are. Um, and I think when you have those things, I think when you're good with your boundaries as well, you recognize your boundaries, you can give yourself permission to be flexible, but you can also be rigid whenever you have to be. And what you don't do is you don't allow people to wander through life just plugging their umbilical cord into you to try to feed off you. So, yeah, I would I would agree with what you said, Virginia. Maybe I just phrased it slightly differently. Um Because I'm living my therapies, expressing myself, family doesn't have me around anymore. It gets lonely at times, but the peace is worth it. Record Hound, um, again, I'm not sure of what's going on with your family, but what I will say is sometimes people preferred the version of us they had. They don't like the version of us that is a bit more assertive, that is maybe doing things in our own best interest, that is able to say no, that has boundaries, um, that, that are moving forward in life. They preferred the version that was they considered to be controllable so whenever we start uh moving forward they let us go it's not that we let them go sometimes they let us go uh, 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 love a series on different other mental illnesses with interacting with narcissists how do you manage that um that's a good topic as well yeah because there is so much out there um it's obsessive compulsive personality, avoidant personality. There's lots of different stuff going on and how they interact with each other sometimes in different situations and relationships. That's something I'll look into. That's something I'll start putting some content in because I do talk a lot about narcissism because a lot of people ask me to talk about narcissism, which is fair enough. Um, but I think that would be interesting looking at the different dynamics. Yeah, I'll look into that for you. Okay, and lastly, where are you talking about class? Thank you for expanding. Um, a narcissist psychopath once told me he likes who he is, doesn't need to change all the while, causing chaos and abusing people closest to them. That's what I mean. Some people, um, they wouldn't even know what they are. They just think it works for them and they're fine as they are. They don't need to change. And that's, that's the difficulty. So... That's me pretty much come to an end. Thanks for joining me, everyone. I hope I answered your questions. I might not have answered them as in-depth as you would have liked to. I might not have even answered them properly. I'm answering them based on, on what I think, just on the information I have. Um, is there an overlap between narcissism and paranoid personality disorder? There can be. There can be an element of narcissism, uh, comorbid. There can be, yeah. So, listen, you, you've made a lot of noise. Do you want to say hello to everyone? Come on. Up you get, up you get. No, up. You can do this. You always do this. Up you get, buddy. Come on. I'm going to say hello to Freud, because people have asked before. Oh, up you get, buddy. Ah, right. There he is. There's the hairy foo. Ah. He's the brains of the outfit. He's the one that gets all the content ready. I just do the voice. He can't talk, because he's a dog, you see. I do all the talking, but he's the one that does all the work. Don't you? Absolutely. Do you think I should let him out and see his new buddy? He's not going to be able to see him over the wall, like, but I could let him out anyway. <laughs> there you go. He's normally very good. He just sleeps in the corner, nice and quiet, while I waffle away. Not tonight. Come on. You're all right. You happy enough now? You want to get down? Good boy. Down you get. Yep, down you get. Good boy. He's heavier than you think. Um, <laughs> he cannot talk, but he really loves you so much. He only loves me because I feed him and walk him. <laughs> I'm his pet. 
That's the truth. He is, he will be four this summer. Um, is he a standard poodle? No, he is, uh, he's, he's a, a, what do you call it? A, a cocker spaniel. That's what he is. He's a cocker spaniel. Yeah. When he's upside down, he's got like bat ears. You don't see him. He's very funny looking. Um, Freud's a good boy. He needed to waffle himself for a bit. Yeah, such a pretty dog. Oh, he is. Tell you what, he turns heads everywhere he goes. He is such a good looking boy. Absolutely. Aren't you? Handsome chap. Takes after me, you see. Don't you? Uh, uh, do you know what? I need to bring Freud up here. I need to put him on camera more often because he gets more views than I do. Um, all right, buddy. Well, yeah. Listen, everybody, thanks, Freud. Yes, Freud. His name is Freud. Yes, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What do you think? What would you do if you were me? Huh? What do you think? Hmm? He's my therapy dog. <laughs> um, I was going to say, yeah. It a second fiddle to me. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Listen, everybody, thanks again for joining me. I do appreciate you joining me. As I said, I do hope you find um, some of the stuff interesting tonight. Normally, I have a topic and a subject. I just thought I did a question and answer one time before, and I thought that um, I might try that again. I was supposed to do this on Sunday, uh, but because, uh, well, I'm at a funny age, and unless I write it down, I forget. Sunday evening, I forgot I'm supposed to be doing a live stream, so that's why it's tonight instead. Um, but the next one will be on a Sunday because uh, I do alternate uh, alternate between the, the two days. So next one will be in about 10 days, and I will do it on a Sunday. And if you just want me to talk about a topic, a particular subject, leave a comment, let me know. Um, I will put it out on the community channel, um, the community tab thing that I'll be doing a live stream have a topic topic you want me to cover let me know if not i might just do another uh question and answer session okay so until next time everybody thanks for watching look after yourselves and don't forget check out uh the the comment thing i'll put um uh, in the description i'll put links to jay reed stuff and to richard gran and stuff I think it's unfair because I do contact some other people and they never get back to me. So, okay. But I don't like putting up people's stuff without their permission. So that's, that's why. But, uh, okay, everybody, take care. Bye now.